So 2024 is the 20th anniversary of the release of my second book, Through a Glass Darkly. This was the book, the project that changed my life. And everything that I've done since then is because of the work that I made in this book. All the artworks were made using Holga cameras, like this one, with Polaroid backs on the back. Uh, basically, Holaroids. Um, and I made for over two years, well over a hundred finished artworks using these cameras. There were three of them that I had. There was Mr. Red, this is Mr. Orange, and then there was Mr. Pinhead. As you can understand, Mr. Red had a red filter, Mr. Orange had an orange filter, and Mr. Pinhead, well, it was a pinhole version of the Holga camera. This was such a pivotal body of work for me. Um, I just wanted to share this experience. And it just dawned on me a couple of days ago that it has been 20 years since the book came out. Um, prior to this body of work, all of the work that I've made was what I would consider more traditional uh, large format photography. I was writing for PhotoVision magazine. Our works was being featured in camera arts. You know, we were out there. We were very much in that very traditional vein. But everybody who remembers 2003, 4, 5, 6, that time period, everything was changing. Digital was absolutely at the door, not knocking, but trying to kick the door down, you know, trying to kick analog out the door. And I was frustrated. I was a frustrated analog large format photographer. And I just wasn't making the work that I felt I was meant to make. And that's when on like a Friday afternoon, I went out and I got a Holga camera, got myself a Holga back for it and just started experimenting and just playing. I always say that experimentation is key. Play is so important. And I bought an inexpensive scanner and I started making work. And over the course of three days, I knew this is what my work had to be going forward forever at that point. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the cameras. So the Holga camera, as you know, is a plastic toy camera with remarkable capabilities. The Polaroid back, that mounts on it, mounts just the way the back of the camera mounts on. It looks just like this. It has a dark slide, so you could change backs, technically speaking. It has a tripod mount on the bottom. I am missing the filter that used to lock on the front of the lens to allow the image to go further back and be in focus, or kind of in focus, on the Polaroid itself. Um, I have them somewhere. I used to have these three cameras in a bag and I carried it all the time. This is a newer incarnation of a Hoka camera that I've been using the last couple of years. But it really easily mounts on the back. I'll mount it up here. And then I'll show you how the film loads. Okay, maybe it doesn't mount as easy as I remember. I never used to take these things off. Uh, there we go. Okay, it's locked on and it's locked on. Uh, the film that the camera uses, uh, shockingly, I still have probably 30 or 40 boxes of it in my refrigerator. This was type 89. It's a square Polaroid format. Um, funny part is I only have color left over in my fridge when all the work in the book and all the work I made back then was in black and white. And what happened was is I suspect I got all of this Polaroid from Polaroid itself. Um, this entire body of work, all the artworks in the book, all 25 of them, were part of the Polaroid collections. Uh, when the book came out, this is one of the final images I'll show you. Was, they were framed in welded steel with den glass. Uh, there was an exhibition of this work in Paris, in Vermont. The book is in French and in English uh, translations. And, you know, so I'm suspecting that I got this film from Polaroid uh, as a thank you for the images that they got. They never gave you cash, they gave you film, which was fine with me. Um, so let's talk about loading the film up. I have no idea if this film is even gonna work. This film is quite old, so it's gonna be hit or miss. You see it's from uh, 2006, but it has been in the fridge, so we got a chance that it might work. Ah, old Polaroid, the smell of Polaroid. Once again, this has got a tab you have to pull on here. So load it in, it loads in just like that. You make sure that all the little white end tabs are not caught. You close it, you lock it, and then you just pull on the block 
and now you're ready to shoot. Um, so let's take a picture of the camera here while we're filming this. Let's see if this is gonna work. Here we go. I'm just gonna take something like this. Let's see. And this is peel apart Polaroid film. There is some goo on the end, so the pod did work. Let me try another one. Uh, let's see. Let me pull this back out. This camera's been modified a lot to do a lot of different things. Let me put it on sunny. And maybe we'll take one more for fun and see if that happens. Uh, let's go back to cloudy. All right, so we'll give that 90 seconds to process. Wouldn't it be great if Polaroid always processed in 90 seconds nowadays? Um, the thing about the book is that some years back, I set aside uh, boxes of this book, thinking that in the future, I would want these books to come back out. Um, the book itself was printed at arguably the finest printing press in the world, which no longer exists in that incarnation. It was printed at the Salto Press. Um, Salto was in Belgium, George and Nadia ran it. And what they were able to do with this book and myriads of other books by other artists and photographers that I knew is incredible. The images in the book are reproduced at 600 line screen. That's the type of resolution that you print currency at. I mean, absolutely amazing. It's quad tone offset lithography, um, literally running one black per day, allowing the inks to dry. Um, they imported the ink uh, from uh, Toyo Ultra Black Inks from Japan because I wanted the blacks in the book to match the blacks of my actual artwork. And it was an incredible experience. Um, there was a prospectus for the book that came out initially. And it says here that there were 600 lion screen reproductions printed at Salto on Salto number three, 200 GSM text. The paper for the book, I remember going to the mill, is absolutely beautiful. No one really makes books like this anymore. It's just not cost effective, and especially in 2024. I mean, the end leaves on the book are pure black. The paper, when you feel it, it's just, it's beautiful. And it's funny, I, I don't spend a lot of time looking at these books. This is work from a long time ago, but I've been looking at the last couple of days and just remembering how much joy making this project brought me. The reproductions in the book are just beautiful. And everything in the book is reproduced at the actual size of the uh, original artworks. Um, once again, another piece from inside of the book. And then the book also had a gatefold in the middle, and that was fun to have our wonderful graphic designer make happen. Um, the gatefold, it's a double gatefold actually, that folds out like this with even more artwork. Um, and as I mentioned, the book is in French and in English in the back. My wonderful, amazing wife Eve wrote the uh, preface in the back, it's incredible. Um, and if you read this, you'll hear an awful lot of what I've been talking about on the Fisher Revolution since 2005. The idea of the joy of photographic imperfections, using imperfections as a springboard for more work. I mean, all the things that I talk about really came into this book. The, uh, the blind boss on the cover of the fabric, the head and tail bands, Everything about this, I, I wish books like this were still being printed, but as I said, I, I see very few on the market. So what I have decided to do is to bring these books back out. They are on uh, my website, evensteve.com. There's a link in the description. And the books retailed for $50 back in uh, 2004, 2005, and as long as they were for sale. I've put them back at $50. However, if you type in the coupon code, 20, just two zero, you'll get 20% off on the book. That's a special that I'm running uh, right now here in Fisher Revolution, and it'll go on uh, at least for the foreseeable future. Um, if you want the book hand inscribed to you, please let me know. Um, but I just wanted to share this. I said this was a real sort of memory lane moment for me. Um, let's take a look at the Polaroids and see if they're actually working out at all. Well, this one's black, but that's not bad because it does have decent uh, chemical spread on it. This one is black as well, so we're not doing too good so far. And uh, number three, 
Well, it kind of made something, but not really an image. Let me take a picture outside real quick. It is kind of dark in here, and this is slow film. Let me take a picture outside real quick. I'll be right back, and we'll see if we can get that to work. I'd like to see the Polaroid camera work one more time. Well, I don't even need to go outside. I can tell you exactly why these Polaroids didn't work. Even though on the back of the thing I have printed dark slide, lens cap, got to take it out. I left the dark slide in the camera, so that's why there was no image. So let's try this one more time, shall we? All right. There's one. Let's get these out of the way because they are kind of worthless. And let me take another one out the door. So I took three more out the door, one on the cloudy setting, one on the sunny setting, and then yet another one on the sunny setting. I can't believe that I forgot to take the dark slide out. Once again, even with my best label maker, you know, everybody makes mistakes from time to time. Um, I'm very excited to see them in 90 seconds if we have something here. What's interesting too is that you really can't use the viewfinder when you have this back on. You kind of just had to know what was going to be in the frame. But fortunately, because older Polaroid processed so fast, if it wasn't perfect, you could tweak it. I did a lot of shots with this, and they're in the book. And one in particular, I, I, I remember this story. Um, let me see if I can find it here. I was in Middletown Springs, Vermont, and it was uh, late one evening, like by late, I mean like 10 o'clock at night, and there was this group of trees that I wanted to photograph. This is them right here. There was this group of trees that I wanted to photograph, and I knew I was gonna need to use a handheld flash. So what I did is I had the camera on a tripod with a cable release, and I pop a flash, and then behind me, I hear a siren go off. There was a Vermont State Trooper sitting in the parking lot that I didn't know about, and of course, he wanted to know what the heck I was doing photographing these trees in the dark on this remote back road. And then he got interested in what I was doing, and he brought over his big mag light, and while I'm painting the scene with my flashes, I had the Vermont Trooper painting the trees with his mag light, and the artwork turned out perfect. But I think the exposure was still something like five or six minutes, taking into account, you know, the incredibly not there light and the reciprocity uh, of the actual materials. So once again, Through a Glass Darkly is now available for the first time in many, many, many years. Um, and it said, if you want it signed to you, please just let me know in the description. Uh, let's see how these turned out. It worked, oh my God, yes. So this one's kind of dark. I'll do a little zoom over them in a minute, but it actually did work. That's kind of nice to see. Um, the next one worked actually shockingly well, uh, considering this is from 2006. You'll notice that there's a black frame around the image. So the square couldn't use the whole image. It only used a section of the image. And I felt that that was, yeah, and this is the one that I did for daylight. So the one that was the cloudy one is actually correct. And so I felt that that was kind of important, sort of the, the purity of the process. So here in the prospectus, you can see, I kept that same, you know, awkward sort of black frame. I felt that it added to, uh, to the actual physical process and to just the look and feel of the work. So I'll do a quick zoom over, talk about this just a little bit more and uh, yeah. I can't believe they worked. All right, so I went outside and uh, shot one more of the Polaroids. It's been a long time since I've used peel apart material um, and it's definitely satisfying when you see an image come out. It's, it's quite beautiful. Uh, on this particular Polaroid camera, um, as I said, this is a modification from what I would have used back in 2003 and four. I've actually inverted the lens and I have the focus preset to create a particular visual quality that I liked for some work that I did a few years ago. But in essence, it's actually kind of nice how it looks. Let me show you some of the, uh, some of the uh, Polaroids here. Let me see if I can go right where for this minute. Okay, so here we go. So you know, you can see it's got sort of this blurry uh, outside. This is that black frame I was talking about that I decided to use. Kind of like, you know, you're sort of going into the frame, you're tunneling into the image. 
This here was shot uh, with the cloudy day setting. This was shot for the sunny. And this is just another one I just took out my front door. So I have to say, it kind of gives me chills a little bit uh, coming back and looking at this work and looking at the cameras and seeing the work that I made uh, all those years ago. Thank you very much for listening. I can't wait to hear your thoughts. Now go shoot some film.